Hey guys, this is James, and uh, you're watching Major OSC Unlimited. Um, this is going to be a ongoing series of videos dedicated to sound design tutorials, um, and it is also um, a Patreon uh, access um, subscription. I'm starting this because um, I think it's a really good way of getting um, a lot of my uh, kind of subscribers, fans, customers of presets. Uh, get you guys um, more familiar with how I design them uh, so you can go off and design your own. Because um, when I think about it long term, honestly, I don't think I can see myself doing a patch collection every three to six months and then expecting you guys to spend 30 bucks and go, and then go off and do your own sounds based on those. It's like it doesn't really make sense. Um, and it's not a long term solution for, for you know, um, for a living on on my side, I'm I'm unemployed at at the moment. Major OSC is technically a, the full time gig right now, um, so there's got to be some other ways of um, of providing value, um, and um, you know my services and um, just making a difference. You know, giving back to the community. So this is sort of my way of doing that, and um, I'm making it four bucks a month. Um, you're gonna have access to um, a ton of presets for every synth that I own, including soft synths um, and hardware synths and um, it won't be the hardware synth patch banks those are still going to be for sale separately but there are going to be a few of them from each one and then I'll uh, whatever we make in the video it'll also be available and then I'll just be doing some for fun and putting them out weekly but um, yeah I've just mainly this is uh there's going to be a lot of in-depth videos um, they're going to be full of talking but they're going to uh, contain a lot of good information and um, I've been doing sound design for well over a decade um, and before that I was a patch diver, just like anybody else, you know, I was just patch surfing. Um, I would say that I, I learned more in two weeks with a Moog little fatty than I did with two years of a virus TI. Gives you an idea of, you know, a synth hardware in front of you can make such a big difference. Um, a similar thing happened to me when I was using Dune. Dune is sort of really what, what kind of got me into doing stuff in a mod matrix because it's just right there plus it was a cheap bst to buy and it sounded great but um you know i think of the equivalent of dune as sort of is is the hydra synth it's just so straightforward and it's immediate and i think it's a perfect platform to teach on I'm not always going to be teaching on the hydra synth but um we're definitely going to be doing a lot of videos on the hydra synth probably for the foreseeable future at least you know for a couple months and i might do you know throw in a couple synths here and there for fun and those are going to be smaller videos. I'm planning to put out one large tutorial video each week and then doing um, like a couple of micro tutorials and or fun activities um, where we design a patch or we just kind of talk about different kinds of patch types. Or, you know, I might go through one of my presets from a patch bank that's particularly of interest and explain why I made it or how I made it or both really. Um, but yeah, this one, um, we're going to start out with, uh, with Hydrosynth because... To be honest with you, I think 90% at least uh, of my customer base, um, repeat customers and new customers, is all Hydrosynth, Ignition and Ignition 2. And I have to tell you, it is, I'm not getting unemployment. I'm supposed to be collecting it, but it got cut around July. Um, bullshit technicality. So it's basically delaying my unemployment for three to four months. Ignition sales alone have kept me up to date on my bills and kept food on the on the table for my family. So this, if anything, I owe you guys. I mean, and so that's why I'm putting I'm putting this gigantic video out for free. Uh, one to show you how thankful I am, and um, and two to kind of get 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 a new project started, get something launched going forward, not just patch collections every three to six months. I want to actually show you guys that designing patches is really not that hard. It's fun as hell, especially on the Hydrosynth. And you can get really good at it really quickly. Um, you just got to know a couple of tricks. You got to know the philosophy. That's really the big advantage of, I think, if you're, um, if you're signing up for this Patreon account, um, it's going to be four bucks a month. And, at, you know, after each month, I think you're going to know enough to design a new type of patch each, each month um, with ease. Like, you're going to be an expert on it. Um, so, um, yeah, that's really the end goal is just get you, get you sounding better and get you to have more fun with whatever hardware is in front of you. Um, but just keep in mind, it's not always going to be Hydrosynth for now. I think it's safe to, to say that it's 
probably going to be a, a great way to teach uh, because of this screen right here and because um, a lot of these lessons are very universal. So in this lesson in particular, um, we're going to be covering envelopes. Um, lessons after this one, they're going to be LFO, filter, um, just one thing about modulating, one thing about looping filter or looping envelopes and LFOs, designing sequences. It's going to be a big video each week, right? But this is the free one. So the rest of them are going to be released on my Patreon account. And um, I think for four bucks, just to sign up for a month and get all the free shit that you're going to have available to you is probably worth it because every drum sample that I've ever personally designed is also going to be available. And there's probably 50 to 100 of them, and they sound pretty good. Um, and they're all based, they're all pulled from my productions, so they're basically lightly EQ'd and processed and fused samples from all over the place. But we'll get into that a little bit later. So let's talk about envelopes. All right, this is, uh, this is the... School is in session. Envelopes live and die by the clock. They're the lifeblood of patch design of synthesizers. They, they, they let the sound pass through. They're like a garage or a gate. Very much like one. So the envelope we're dealing with is ADSR. Attack, decay, sustain, release. Three of them are a measure of time. One of them is a measure of value or amplitude or just think of it as value for this because um, it doesn't always apply to amplitude. First one I'm showing you applies to amplitude because um, it's the volume or amp, the amp envelope, right? These right here, envelope two, control what comes out of the hydrosynth. They're the gatekeepers. We hear nothing now because sustain is at zero. Sustain is at max. We hear instantaneous sound turning on and instantaneous off when I let go of the key. That's because there is a zero attack and zero release. Those of you might be able to guess, attack is the measure of time for the sound to come up, and release would be the measure of time for the sound to, uh, to dissipate, right? Your sustain relative, when you're holding a note, think of the sustain as your final destination of value. It's where you will end up after you factor in these two, attack and decay. Let's draw an envelope and I'll show you what I mean. All right. In fact, let's just hit. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to save this patch earlier. Oh, well. Ah, we can just keep it. Um, so I'll just get these curves fixed real quick. Sorry for the delay here. Okay. Oh, I want to set this reset on. When in doubt, reset turned on all envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> until you learn otherwise. It might actually complicate your life if you're already designing patches and you know something, a thing or two, but if you're a complete novice, I'd say it's safe to say just put re turn on reset for the most part when you're, when you're starting a patch because it'll save you some headache. Um, so in envelope two, these two added together it, as a measurement of time are going to be what you hear first, sustain is going to be the level you end up at, right? Start at zero. So if I do an attack of a half second, it's gonna take a half second to get the max um, volume. The decay is, you know, it, it's, if I have anything less than 100% of sustain, the decay is going to immediately start when the attack time runs out, right? So then you're on a t decay time. So it's probably best to show you the example of when sustain is turned off and then another one where sustain is turned on. When sustain is turned completely off, let's think about what kind of patch that would be. Piano, keys, right? Something where you press it down and it dissipates and goes away, even when you're still holding it, just like a piano. You don't press a piano and those strings don't vibrate by themselves endlessly. They go away. Um, so for that kind of sound, you just want to have a decay time of maybe... One and a half seconds, one second. Oh. You're going to have to go to an init patch. There we go. Okay, so decay time, roughly one second. Look at that. Also worth noting, when your sustain is at zero and you have a decay time like this, this is the, these are the kind of patches where having a sustain pedal um, makes a lot of sense, especially if you have a decay that's long enough to fool 
people into thinking that it's actually release, right? Here's one way of looking at it. You have sustain turned way up and you have a long release. You can do this. Right? Let's just add some reverb to make it sound nicer. Yeah, a little bit of chorus. Whatever, right? right? That's just tapping the notes. If I hold them down, they're just going to stay on forever. It's because when I'm in envelope two, I turn that to sustain way up. But when I hit the sustain pedal, it's also going to stay on forever. Right? I like using the sustain pedal a lot for when I'm playing keys. Anything that's even remotely close to an electric piano. It's just fun, and, and you can get a lot more melodic expression and, and, and kind of um, rhythmic variation when you have a sustain pedal. You can hold, the long notes can be as long as you need them, and um, it just, it's just going to sound way more dynamic and better, right? So best be able to know why and when to use a sustain pedal. So if we're designing keys, it sustains at zero. We're gonna have a decay time that is somewhat long, two seconds, let's try that. I'm gonna hold down the sustain key, uh, pedal. Right, it sounds just like if we were, you know, tapping it with a long release, but let's turn release to zero and do that same thing. And I'm just gonna hold down the sustain pedal. Right, there we go. Advantage of this is, well, it's just a little bit of release just because I want it to sound fake. Okay, I'm terrible at playing, sorry, but there's a good example. Um, using zero sustain attack decay are pretty much your go-to's that applies to keys in particular let's turn sustain all the way up let's turn attack to like a half second no I'm even let's do a full second right decay we're gonna leave it zero why? Because anytime you have sustain maxed out, you don't need any decay because it's not going down at all. It's staying up. So basically it's a mountain and then, or a mesa and you're plateaued. What are we missing here? We're making a pad. Release. Releases your tail. Think of that as the tail or how long it takes for the garage door to close and the sound to go away completely. Right, I got 3.32 seconds. Okay, oops, should stay there. Next, release curve, attack curve, decay curve. Logarithmic and exponential. The um, half pipe or boob. Curve the other way. <laughs> um, those are the kind of things um, that are going to help you sculpt the sound even further. Um, and it's going to add tons of characteristics to your sound. So release uh, these. To, the fact that you can even do that on a hydro synth is such a huge advantage. You can't do that on all this, all this, a lot of other synths. Some of them you can, some of them you can't. But um, the, the fact that you can dial it in this severely is is awesome so look at this the release curve look at that i can basically make it almost completely disappear except for this right here think of what that's going to sound like when it's 15 seconds long or seven seconds long even. right Here's what it sounds like opposite of that. Let's shorten it just a little. It's gonna just pretty much off, right? Let's just reduce it so we don't have to wait as long. 1.53 seconds. Press down, right? 
pretty self-explanatory, I'd imagine. So the fact that you have a visual is a big help. Use that to your advantage. Figure these out first. Don't think about the seconds. Then once you have this figured out, once you have an idea of what each type does, you'll be able to draw it ahead of time. I know that if I'm making something like a pad, I don't want it to I don't want it to be too extreme either way, but I don't want it to be linear per se. It just depends on how much tail you want. Really it does. Time makes a difference. Okay, I'll give you an example where this sort of shape would make sense. Um, if you've ever heard of Hans Zimmer, um, his work for Inception, at the very end where that dreidel or whatever the the top the um the totem that when the when the totem is spinning spinning, there's like a reverse note that's played. It sounds a lot like a piano or a very very high pitched chime um, that's been reversed, um, like a, the wave been reversed. So it goes yep right. but it doesn't completely cut off. It doesn't go to zero. We still hear a little bit at the end, right? It could be one of two things. It could be either reverb or it could be a tail to whatever it was. Now we're thinking about this in the context of actually reproducing a sound like that. We're not trying to get the sound exactly like it. We're just, I use that as an example to kind of give you an idea of what, what kind of thing we're doing. So this would be like a reverse stinger or a transition, uh, a utilitarian patch, right? It's still technically a pad, but this would be for like specific purposes of like bringing into a new section. So so let's go to that exponential. Let's make it like almost completely maxed out. As soon as we let go of it, there's just a teeny bit of tail, right? But it doesn't cut off quickly or abruptly. If you have it opposite, tell it's just pretty much gonna, it's gonna sound like it's almost cutting out instantaneously. See, it didn't sound like it trailed off at all. So really it's just, um, it's gonna be your, it's gonna be up to you to kind of uh, figure out what kind of curve works best. Um, I just want to give you some examples as um, that Hans Zimmer one is um, going to demonstrate more the attack behavior, right? If you have something that's um, logarithmic, you go, yep, and it's going to get louder the last few moments, but it's going to sound pretty quiet for the first, for more of the first half, right? Especially when you extend the amount of attack time. At the end, of it, that was the biggest, quickest increase in volume. So how let's let's accelerate the time and, and reduce it. This is going to be a big thing for making attack transients symphonic. An example here. So instead of having to rely on the uh, the release and keeping the sustain at max and having to time and lift off. You can turn the sustain down and program a decay, a modest decay, right? It'll give us time to remove our hands while the sound is, is decaying, right? And then after that, it'll be up to the release to determine when the sound completely disappears. So you can see that in this case, these two are sort of, it's sort of a balancing act between these two. Let's see. All right, let's reduce the attack curve thing a little bit closer to linear. So we're going to try and do strings, right? For that, just side lesson here quick. Mutant 2, dry, wet, wave stack. Depth, 30. Have strings. You can tell just making this shape and adding mutant to has given us something that's quite usable. Turn down the 
filter a little bit. There we go. You get the idea. Okay. That'll cover most of what I'd wanted to show you in the amp envelope section. Ah, oh, one additional thing. Let's say you're making a bass or a pluck. This is sort of the universal shape you should be thinking of. That, right? Don't worry about the time. Worry about the decay curve. Something extremely sharp and percussive is gonna have pretty much maxed out decay curve. Reduce that release just to make it even more apparent. Now, so with the decay curve is like exponential 60. Decay time and shorter, it's just going to get that much more prevalent. Even if we jack it up to like one or two seconds, it's still going to be pretty quick. We're approaching Pluckville here. So let's turn up the release. Hmm. Well, that works on volume envelope. I wonder if it'll work on filter envelope. It does. Do the same sort of thing with filter. Sustain at zero, decay time, who cares? We're gonna figure that out in a minute. Decay curve, I'm gonna put it pretty close to 60. I'll do like 55. And decay time, 1.6 cents, uh, whatever. Okay, so we got a similar looking envelope here, right? See that, they're almost identical. Um, obviously you're not hearing anything in the filter because there's nothing modulating it yet. We have an open and closable filter right up here. I'll turn up the resonance just so it's that much more apparent for you. Right? This is how it'll sound when your knob is in center. That's with no filter modulation. Let's go into the filter itself. Filter right here. Filter one. Right? You're going to see key track by default at 100. Turn it down to zero unless you're planning on making stuff with harmonics, which I'm going to cover in a completely other lesson. Um, so keep keep that at zero. What you want to focus on is envelope amount, right? So in Hydrosynth, envelope one controls the filter. It's a designated pre-routed modulation source, right? So envelope one will determine how much the filter is either opened or closed. For the purposes of this tutorial, think of it as just opening. Because a lot of the times we're going to be dealing with, oh, sorry, we'll go back into our filter menu. We're going to be dealing with positive value modulation for the filter. That means wherever the filter is, close or open, the process starts and goes up. That means the filter will open. So if we have a positive envelope amount, but our filter is closed, the, tr the idea is that this is at filter close immediately, whoops, immediately the filter will open and then instantly start to, or I should say very quickly start to decay um, like that. Hence the sound of a pluck, right? We're holding down the notes. It's actually going to completely close and we won't be able to hear anything for two reasons. For one, the filter is going to be completely closed and two, envelope two, Sustain is at zero, so there's not even going to be an oscillator playing underneath that filter. Let's say there is. Can't hear anything, can you? No. Let's turn up envelope one, sustain, just a little bit. Huh. Right? I would really like more hum. I like the plug, but I like more hum. I really want to feel pre uh, I want it to feel present. Let's go back to envelope two and turn the sustain pretty much almost all the way up, like there, right? Now I can really hear it. We got ourselves pretty much a usable bass. 
get rid of the reverb here. So look at that. See right there, that's pretty abrupt. A release at zero. That means the filter is closing right back to zero or its resting point as soon as we're done touching that note. Turn the release up a little bit. Assuming we have a little bit of release here, we're going to be hearing a little bit of a tail and it's going to be closing the filter. Perfect, right? Your relationship between release and decay is very important because if your release is too quick, it will sound a little bit abrupt when you let go of the notes. If it's too long, it won't sound like it's doing anything. It'll just sound like the sustain is staying where it is. I'm gonna try and get a really good demonstration of this by cranking up the resonance. Oops, okay, okay. Let's say our decay time is 2.3 seconds, right? And get a nice long release, 3.32 seconds, all right. I'm gonna turn cutoff all the way up just so we can hear what it sounds like after I let go. Oh, I could, I could use a little bit less of a curve. Yeah, that was at 51. Let's go down to like 30. That sounds a little bit more, you know, normal. Yeah, it goes away, pretty much gets out of our way relatively quickly. So what happens when we close our filter and the release is very, very short? Well, that just completely kill our tail because the release is closing. It's, it's, if we have only one point, one second of release time, that means the filter's going back down to zero in one second as soon as we let go of the notes. But according to envelope two, we could be hearing the sound for as long as, well, try not to think of it as exact times. I'm just using this time as kind of a way to illustrate it, but we could be hearing it for much longer, several seconds longer. That much longer instead of, right? So ideally, if you want it to match, you'll want to have the release equal or greater than what your amplitude is. So for this, I'm going to crank up the envelope one release, which is the filter. Um, envelope one controls the filter. We're gonna crank this release up to like four. Gonna check the release curve is 32, just about the same as um, envelope two. Envelope two is at 26, but oh well. Crank it up to 30 just to get it closer. Now it's kind of uniform. Okay, so envelope one and two having similar release times is Effective, it's not required. There's different characteristics for different scenarios. So if your envelope two release is short, and it's not gonna, the filter's not gonna close completely, because it, it, it would have taken a lot longer for it to close after you let go of it. So if anything, it just sounds like it stayed open or it stayed at its sustain point. See what I'm doing? Does that make sense? You have the sustain almost at max. That means the filter is opening instantaneously, coming down just a little bit very quickly, and then just staying there. Even when we let go of the note, because that release is so long, it's just gonna, it's not really gonna sound like it's closing at all after that. So sustain is everything. Sustain is your value. It's the measure of value. It's not a measure of time. So it will drastically affect your plucks, your bass, anything with transient, transients. And you'll soon find out it's not just applying, it's not, this isn't just useful for modulating the filter, it's going to be useful for modulating everything. Okay. Now, 
let me explain something about envelope two and sustain. Um, volume. For those of you who are producers, especially if you produce any sort of electronic music that is considered modern, which means heavy compression, heavy dynamics, very, very punchy, poppy dynamics, everything's kind of sound sculpted and, sculpted and overboard. Um, want a good example? Eric Prids, right? You go to listen to any Eric Prids track, those things are compressed to incredible levels, but it's not smashed to bits. It's not like it's not dynamic. Key is getting stuff sounding punchy without ruining the dynamics. If you're recording a synth, pretty much anything with this kind of behavior, you're gonna want a compressor. It'll punch through the mix, it'll sound cool, it'll, it'll hit you where it counts, right? Um, having this kind of shape in your amplitude and in your filter is going to help when you compress it, when you, um, so basically, if you exaggerate a little bit beyond what you'd really want, it'll actually sound normal once you've compressed it. I can't demonstrate it now, but I will try to give you an example of like before and after. So a lot of times when I know I'm designing a patch that's going to be used in a production, usually in the middle of a production, I just go off and make a new bass or something like that. Um, I will keep that in mind and um, make it exaggerated. So that means really quick decay. So you can tell it's got a lot quieter, or at least the, the final volume when I'm holding it got quieter. That would be full. That would be none. Have it about here. You know what, I'll just use the compressor on here as an example. See if that compressor on here does not behave the way I'm used to a compressor behaving. So this is gonna be a little tricky, but let's get the attack up. Attack is everything on a compressor. We've got a ratio, let's do like 10 to one. I mean, it's basically the limiter at this point. Um, let's get the attack up and get the, doesn't matter, at least it really doesn't matter at the moment. Um, Let's get that rate. You know what? I'm going to exaggerate and just crank up the ratio and we're going to mess with the threshold and you're going to start hearing a pop. Okay, that's with sustain at max. So there's no dynamics. Exaggerate it. Get that compressor. You just get that. So yeah, this compressor is pretty much useless. I have not found any sweet spots. And it behaves nothing like the compressor on any of the stuff I've used because usually an attack time of 40 milliseconds-ish, nice quick release, and a ratio of 3 to 1, and a threshold of, I don't know, make it of... Anything like that should make a pretty drastic difference. Not much of one. That's with an output of even a boosted output. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm not saying you should go off and make exaggerated dynamics for every patch just because you know at some point you might put it through a compressor. What I'm saying is messing with this decay time, especially making the snappiness, messing with that while you're in production, after you've added your filter and gotten at least to a point where you're somewhat happy with it, can really go a long way in adding even more punch to something. So um, take, a take a compressor preset that you are used to using in Ableton Live or whatever it is, whatever DAW you're using, um, attack roughly at 30 to 40 milliseconds, release time, don't make it too short, but don't make it too long either. 
um, and um, threshold maybe negative six and negative ten, and then ratio at like three to four to one. Then start messing with K. Ooh, it got loud real quick. Maybe we were just a little too quick with the decay for the compressor to like what we were doing. Yeah, there's just really not much of a difference on that compressor. Not sure why. Doesn't matter. Anyways, I thought it was worth mentioning um, because getting punch and dynamics really pushing through your mix, standing out, that's, that's the key to getting this thing to sound really, really fantastic. So at least be aware of that when you're designing these kind of patches. Okay, next, um, I'm going to talk about mod envelopes, but I'm not going to just talk about envelopes as modulation sources. I'm going to talk about them in the context of being destinations. So I'm going to teach you how to modify your mod envelopes. Let's go to envelope three, right? By default, it looks like this. I'm going to press and hold envelope three, and let's pick something. Well, let's stop for a second, actually. Let's think about what... Um, what is typically, what are, what are the noise makers and what affects the noise? Filter, obviously, but you need something to pass through that filter to make the noise, right? Oscillators, obviously, that's your, you know, that's your sound. Those are your noise generators, so to speak. They make, they are the things that pass along a signal. And then on top of that, in the hydrosynth, you got two mutants per oscillator. And then in addition to that, a noise generator, or I'm sorry, a noise generator and a ring modulator. And then they get mixed in this mixer and then they can go into either one or two filters and through an amp. And then over here branches off into these envelopes and they all go back into the amp as well once they're passed through this envelope like that, right? So when we're trying to figure out what kind of patch we're gonna make, um, the oscillators you pick and the mutants are going to be the first things you want to think about when you are going to decide. Making a bass patch, we don't want it to be just bread and butter bass patch, which sounds great. Let's say we want to give it some character. Let's do that. Just know this. If you're using anything other than a saw, you are actually using less um, frequency. Oh, how do I put this? Saw is the most harmonically rich waveform you can use. So anything less than a saw or different than a saw is actually going to be, um, it's going to have different characteristics and it's not going to, <coughs> it's not going to behave like it's been behaving for us doing this. So if I'm making a bass, but I want to retain this, this rich, full sound, I'll probably want to keep at least one saw turned on. I'm going to use oscillator three. And I'm going to pitch oscillator three up to the rest of them. Another waveform to consider, depending on the kind of bass you're making, or pluck you're making, is saw. I'm sorry, is square. And triangle. Try saw and sine. Turn this off. Especially sub bass. You can just use sine all day, all day, baby. Here in Milwaukee, uh, on the corner of Capitol and Humboldt, you're guaranteed to hear this about every three minutes or every stoplight. That's because the inner city is right there and two different colleges. So you have pretty much everybody within a five mile radius that probably has a really good stereo. Yeah. 
I had a cool stereo at one point. It was in an Acura RSX. I had a sub, and I pissed a lot of people off with it. And then I had to sell it. Anyways, sub, sign. Think of it like that. Okay, so we got our low end situated. We lost a little bit. There's not as much, you know, texture now because we're using sign instead of saw, but oh well. We're going to go into oscillator one and we're going to make it a wave scan. Um, and we're going to create a wavetable. All right. And then what we're going to do is use envelope three to modulate that wavetable and to create some kind of interesting texture. And we're going to use the modulation uh, envelope parameters, attack, decay, sustain, release, to determine how we want the sound to evolve. Even if it's just, you know, a transient, even if it's just for a half second or a quarter second. So if I press any one of these buttons on these slots, we'll be getting a preview of whatever waveform I select is there. Oh, but you do need to turn up the volume of that oscillator. So I went to oscillator one. Well, first I went back to mixer and turned it up. Oscillator's back at 128. I went to oscillator one, and then I went to mode and I switched that to wave scan. Then I went to wave list and pressed that button. And now we're in the wave list. I'm gonna turn this, press that button, sorry. I'm gonna get previews. If you wanna hear it a little better, turn up your cutoff. I try to have it on and off depending on, you know, depending on circumstance. Obviously, you're going to want to know what it sounds like with a filter closed, cause, but you want to get a better idea of what the full thing sounds like without a cutoff. That's pretty cool. All right, we got our first one. Just to keep things simple, let's hold shift and then twist this. What that just did is it went, it allowed us to get all of these other ones in chronological order. So if this one's Crime A, probably Chris May, um, Crime A1, holding shift and twisting this knob, you know, until these all change, that just became Crime A1, Crime A2, Crime A3, Crime A4, right? It just went into sequential order. We just built a wavetable. Saves a bunch of time of having to scroll through each one. What I like to do at this point is I don't like to go in order because some of these aren't even ordered how I'd like them to or be ordered, and some of them really aren't even comprehensive wavetables. They're just sort of like a similar collection or themed collection, but they don't really have any kind of smooth progression. Not all of them. So if you're coming from something like Serum, you know, don't expect these to all flow like, like you would hear on Serum. So what do you do? You just preview each one as you go and find textures that are similar or something that you'd want it to evolve into. That's what we're starting with. Maybe not that. That's cool. I could see those morphing. And then what I do is I go that, 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 and I just check each one. Okay, chant them. Okay, I think we got a good one. Chandoms are pretty well organized. Okay, we went from kind of cool and evil sounding to like gnarly and just insane. This one. Okay, so half and one is going to be the end. Okay, that's
that's more like it. Okay, you get a free wavetable tutorial. That's how I build wavetables. Okay, what are we missing? Well, when I play it, all we're hearing is the position of wavetable one, or waveform one. If I move wave scan, both hear the progression, right? We want that to move, right? One of the disadvantages of using all eight and expecting to use all eight is that it becomes very difficult to find consistent, good sounding transients when you're using a mod envelope. What I would suggest is don't modulate in a full, don't modulate to the full 127 value. I'll show you what I mean. We're gonna press and hold oscillator, I'm sorry, press and hold envelope three and then press oscillator one. And what that'll do is automatically set us up in the mod matrix, defaulting envelope three to modulate oscillator one. Now this lets us select within this menu the different ah, destinations. Why the hell is it so quick? I wonder if I need to change that setting. Let's go ahead and do that. Anybody else that's having that problem, pay attention. <laughs> um, I don't remember the screen cutting out that quickly. Huh. It's gotta be here somewhere. <laughs> Oh, light show. Let's just do 30 seconds. Okay, that might that might solve it. Yeah, I think that's probably it. Okay. All right. Oh, we were in our mod matrix, right? Up and down, these two, see that? Press the buttons, it goes up and down, right? Well, we already got envelope three as our source, oscillator one, it's our destination. Now we wanna select what about oscillator one do we need modulated? We're not, we don't want the pitch being screwed with. Let's turn the wheel here and wave. Wave would be if we're using wave forms. So we're in wave table mode, we're gonna have to go one further and wave scan. That basically means we're moving about Wavetable. Now, if I move this around, this is basically like moving about on the wavetable. Why? Because by default, envelope three, the sustain is at max. So any amount I move it up here is basically increasing its range, its max range. So it's moving about the wavetable via this. That's only because the sustain is at max on envelope three. The sustain is at zero, right? And we have no values for anything else. When I move that in the mod matrix, nothing will happen. Right? This brings up the question, well, how do you figure out even where to, what do you, what do you figure out first? How much modulation to move or how your envelope looks? Well, the answer is it depends and you can do anything you want, however you like, whatever's easier for you. I generally know what an envelope will sound like by looking at it and you should too. We know if we do that, we will have some kind of pluck. I see 320 milliseconds, that's a fairly present decay curve. Fair enough. If it were almost zero, we would just hear a click really, or just a There it is. If we have it very long, it'll sound like it's a freaking just a long evolving pad with no attack or release. Feel me? Okay. So. First, figure out your attack. Let's go back to the mod matrix. It sounds like it's moving through several wavetables, not just one or two. The higher you go, the more wavetables it's moving through. So if there's eight wavetables and there's 128 values, 
I'm terrible at math. Please use a calculator. <laughs> you thought I was going to give you the answer, but I'm not. Um, so I, <laughs> you can definitely hear it, though. So at this point, I'm playing notes, and I'm moving this thing until I'm hearing something that I like. Okay, I just got an idea. What if when I play light notes, it'll sound like that, but when I really smack it hard, it'll sound like this. Well, it's fairly simple to do. But before we figured that out, I'm just going to make a quick adjustment on envelope 3 and make that decay a little bit quicker. Since we're just modulating it by that, maybe like 30 or 20 or 30. Just a few wavetables worth. In fact, I'm going to go into oscillator 1 right now and move it up just to see if that makes it any better. Oh, well, let's see how it sounds when I have it at 3. But I move, uh, I only have the mod matrix at like... 20. It's kind of cool. Does it sound better with it back at zero? I like it both. So while, why don't we have the soft notes keep it here, but when we hit a hard note, we move wave scan up, right? That would be kind of cool. So the, the, the amp, the, basically the envelope amount or, or the modulation amount won't change with velocity, but the position of where we start on the wavetable will change. So we want it to be at one by default. I take the mod matrix and then assign velocity on or velo on, that's just velocity essentially, and then pick a destination of oscillator one, wave scan. This means the velocity will instantly jump to that part of the wavetable. There it is. So light notes. Let's make it even more apparent, right? I can hear the difference, but let's make it even more obvious. Let's turn the cutoff down. Resonance down. Let's go back into our filter menu, crank that envelope amount way up. But let's also add some velocity envelope sensitivity. So that means that um, filter is going to be more muted at the at the lighter notes. Get that other oscillator back in here now. Oh, it was all along. Oh, let's get a saw in here. I think I want to increase that even more. Okay, so that one I increased the envelope three modulation amount. That means we're going to be traveling higher into the into the wave table and and then making our progression or our decay down. So if I have just a little bit of this, it's not going to be doing much traveling up. And it's just going to be it's not going to sound much different, but if I have this cranked up, it'll get a good amount of travel. But it won't sound like it's traveling through too many wavetables. If you're traveling through five or six wavetables on a really fast decay curve, it's gonna be like, you know, it's gonna sound like shit. So you wanna have a smooth kind of evolution. And this is a good time to go back into envelope three and check your decay again. Not only your decay, but your curve. Maybe it goes quick and then kind of slows down towards the end. So let's do a exponential
having a good amount of decay curve is also beneficial when you have a when you have a long decay time. Here's why. When you add in some release, it gives you more time to let go of the note and allow it to run its natural course. And it's really hard to explain. So I'm going to have to use a, just a drastic example. If you have too quick of a decay, the decay is already going to be done and finished with, and you're already going to be at your, your end sustain level by the time you let go of the note. So you don't want that to happen. You want to have enough time to at least let go if you want to do shorter notes and then add some release to that. And when you, when you have a little bit of tail and a properly timed release, you're going to actually hear it travel back through some of the wavetables. longer right so if i turn that up to 60 oopsies i believe that was envelope one no no it wasn't never mind envelope three all right turn that way up it'll just it'll just sound like it's not moving at all on the wavetable right but if i get that release down you'll start to hear a difference so you decrease it in fact, it'll go and just come right back if you have too short of a leaf. I think our decay is a little too quick and our curve is a little too steep. I'm going to increase our curve to 32, or rather reduce it to 32, and then we're going to increase decay time. I liked it better with a higher decay curve. Okay, now we can shorten envelope three. Okay, cool. Envelope three, we got a nice snappy, quite snappy envelope. You can tell. If you're modulating it really, really far on wave tables, sometimes it's not always gonna sound cool because it's just traveling too fast. And for something plucky like this, we probably should have used maybe two to three or four wavetable or wave forms max and just made a short wavetable. In essence, what I've done is I've instead I've done a sort of a workaround, which is program velocity to kind of move up and, you know, increase the um, starting point higher up. Okay, cool. Let's assign envelope three to a mutant. Mutant one. Depth, well, let's do 50. Dry wet, we gotta turn that up, don't we? Otherwise we're not gonna hear anything. Let's turn our depth down to zero. So we're starting at zero. We're jumping up by the modulation amount we designated and then we're ending somewhere in the middle and then tapering off. Let's figure out a different uh, oscillator mutant here. Sync. Ooh, harmonic actually sounds kind of neat for this. I don't use harmonic too often. So that envelope works. Let's go to our mod matrix. You can see that it automatically assigned it. Envelope three to mutant one depth. Right. What if we used a different envelope? Let's try envelope one. Let's try envelope two. Or envelope three again. You already have envelopes figured out. You can actually audition each one. Uh, 
You may find that the envelope that you initially intended it for doesn't work as well as you thought and the filter envelope ends up working perfectly. In fact, sometimes it's a good idea if you want any kind of uniformity um, to use the same envelopes for multiple things. Let's use envelope three again on mutant two depth. Hmm. Odd. Let's mutant two wave stack. Oh, yeah. All right. Dry wet down mutant. Right. I forgot. Harmonic completely kills the sound. Let's turn that harmonic. Let's just change that back to um, sync. And let's get. Oh, we lost our initial modulation source. Okay. Sorry. Tinkering here. Hmm. Let's use a new envelope for that one. Envelope four. Okay, so you can hear it cutting off in initially. Like a voice cracking or something. This one, I made an attack, a soft attack, kept the sustain maxed out, and then a gradual, you know, a very modest release. We don't want to just have that boring looking attack. We want to do something a little bit more drastic. So we're going to make it a bit of a logarithmic, or well, technically, I think that's exponential, but it says log here. Whatever. Increase the attack time. Oh, and then reset. Turn that on. Sorry. Sorry. I always forget that. Now let's reduce the attack. Time. I just increase release on all envelopes. That's a common type of envelope, especially when you're modulating mutants and or wavetables. The kind of quick gradual up and then stay at max. What's neat about that is if you crank the envelope depth all the way to max, you can find a range that you'd want it to be maxed out at. That sounds like about, about like an octave. Let's do a, an octave up and a, and a fifth. Told you I was gonna teach you how to modulate a modulator. So what things can affect the envelope while we're pressing it? Just a few. Um, another envelope, an LFO, or and an LFO doesn't always work there. Velocity, right? Think of expressive possibilities when you're talking about modulating envelopes, because envelopes are kind of like the initial party starters. Velocity is a good one. Um, 
aftertouch can be a good one, but that works more for pads because it's after the fact. It's after impact. So it's only going to be able to affect um, attack. Well, it's going to affect all of them, but it's best used on stuff like attack and decay over long periods of time. Aftertouch. Where velocity can affect any of those. Attack and decay especially. Velocity tends to muck with quite well. So let's go into our mod matrix and do velocity on, because that's basically velocity as a source. Destination is going to be envelope three, attack. So the harder we press it, the more attack there is. That means the slower this will start. We might have to change it to four. <laughs> Let's try envelope four. Just for if you're doing something like this and you like what it's doing, but you want it to be more dynamic, try going back into your original envelope and adjusting some of the times and then going back. So maybe we have this at flat. And then the harder you press it, the softer it gets. See how dry wet's at zero for mutant two? Let's try going to our mod matrix and having velocity. Oh no, screw that, not velocity. We're doing envelopes here, what am I thinking? Let's have envelope five, control, mutant two, um, not dry wet, but depth. Go uh, depth, let's see. Stop there and don't assign anything. Exit. Go back to whatever you're modulating. Mutant 2 in this case. Turn your depth down to 0. Turn your dry wet up to 100. That's in this case scenario. That's, that makes sense. There's been other times where I modulate the dry wet and I just want the depth fixed because it only sounds... Some things like FM might only sound good at a certain depth level and I just want the dry wet signal going on and off or it fading in. There's different scenarios and uses for each. In this case, for wave stack, I'm going to want it to go from either tuned to detuned or vice versa. So we're going to keep dry wet at 100 and we're going to be modulating the depth. In this case, envelope 5. You know what? Let's just go make a generic shape in envelope 5. Let's try. Let's try that kind of envelope first. And let's modulate it up. So we're starting there. I think what would be cool is velocity should determine how deep into that envelope modification modulation we do. So instead of assigning a value right here where envelope five modulates mutant two's depth. I'm going to leave that at zero and let another modulation source determine that. And that's going to be velocity. And velocity. This is the key to making dynamic keys, dynamic plucks, stuff that has a lot of different character and just expressibility. So velocity on or velo on, that's going to be velocity as the source. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to just hit the mod matrix button with this blank highlighted. And then I'm going to select, well, we're in four, five, and six. That's four, five, and six, right? We're going to be modulating five. We want it to modulate five depth. That's basically slot. And then whatever value we were going to assign here, we'll want to assign here because that'll be at max value. So the hardest I press it will make it detune by 
30, which is, I think, the original value we had. But if a light, a light touch will be very much not detuned. Let's see how that sounds with some reverb. I think that'll sound pretty cool, actually. adjusting releases that entire time going back and forth pretty neat huh okay well you can stop there if you want or you can add little flares of nicks and knacks. Here's an idea. Let's try taking envelope three and adding a little bit of a delay to it and see what that does. Not so much. Let's try envelope one. Oh, hear that? Hmm. Let's try envelope four. test to see if we can get kind of that sort of thing going. It can add a little bit of flair or subtle nuance, but in this case, it doesn't really seem to make much sense. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's do one more. Let's do envelope four. Let's do envelope four modulates filter. Frequency or resonance rather. You could also do inverse of that. So you could turn up the resonance quite high and then have a harder hit turn down the resonance to kind of, so that way your low notes have a real hum to them. When you hit real hard, it'll make sure that the resonance isn't too crazy when the filter starts rising. Um, so we go back to that and reduce it even further. All right, let's mix in oscillator two again. Let's mix out oscillator three. We don't need a sign anymore. We need a square or saw. See how much more rich and kind of fat that sounds? That's why saw is like the favorite. Because you already hear that kind of... It's pretty fat. instead of sync. See, at this point, we got something established. It sounds good. You could just tinker a little bit with changing some of the static stuff, like the mutant type. 
Before we do that, though, I'm going to hit save. And this is not, no longer, this is not 8-bit sex appeal. That was a pad. I think it was just working in that slot. Let's call this T1 because it was the first tutorial batch that I built. And we're going to save this in, oh boy, we got a ways to go. Oh, that's way easier. Hold down the shift. Um, we'll save that to B1. Oh, no, that's some stuff I'm working on. Uh, B20. Yeah. Um, say, uh, let's see, category base. Okay, that's saved. Now let's go play around with mutants. Ooh, squeeze is always cool. Or if FM, if you really want to go crazy. But FM doesn't always make a difference when you have cut off clothes. <laughs> FM takes some more planning. I'll show you that in another tutorial. Yeah, let's check. EWASM is pretty cool. You can go to custom. Here's a t uh, trick. Go to Mixer, and then see that where it says Solo? It's, uh, I can't remember which page it is. Yeah, it's the first page. You hit press Solo, and then select an oscillator. Oscillator 1, oscillator 2, oscillator 3. Sometimes I've done this and then gone into Post Effects. And or pre effects, and actually designated like EQ and really just dialed in on a wave table or a wave, you know, make this sculpt it some more essentially. <laughs> What we started with this is what we end up with. Fatten it up, reduce the harshness. Let's add in some more oscillators. Uh, we gotta get out of solo mode, hit solo again. I think we're nearing the end of the tutorial. Um, I hope you enjoyed and, um, yeah, if you are on YouTube, which you probably are, um, and you're just linked through the, um, through, uh, Patreon, feel free to like, and subscribe. And, um, thank you for being a member. If you are watching this from Patreon, um, of course, this is the free version. If you want to see more videos like this, head over to the link in the description and it will take you to my Patreon page. And we got a lot of cool stuff planned and it's going to be a blast and, Hopefully I'll teach you um, a ton of new stuff and, and get you sound better and, 
and getting more creative. But um, yeah, but this will be the focus for a while, and then we'll move on to like Summit and DeepMind and Super Six, and you know, I'll use them as examples. But it's not going to be per se synth specific. In fact, we might use some VSTs occasionally. Um, just depends on which one can illustrate an example best. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.